quote from the essay written by Frances Worrell Campbell in the catalogue, which um, it's a beautiful essay. And she describes you as um, a connoisseur of the shimmering stillness of a plane of color, of the vibrating harmony that occurs at the border of the two tones. Um, and hers is a lovely way of describing the very sort of minimalist um, structure of your practice. And given how apparently reduced your compositions are, um, and I imagine the decisions about color are you know, even more important. So I wanted to ask you, how do you go about making your, your choices about color? Um, I think I imagine that I am selecting colors from the landscape often, that they are conditions of light rather than things that are in solid objects. But I think they're perhaps more instinctive than that. Um, I was recently surprised when observing the works that are in this show, um, the your color, the three large sculptural pieces, that the darker blue on one side was actually the blue of the bottle tops in my studio of the water that I drink. Mm -hmm. um, so whereas I'm maybe imagining that they're kind of more disconnected from my everyday experience, I think you could say instinctive or you could say a bit sponge-like. Um, there was a similar situation a few years ago when I painted lots of pink works and I realised that was a result of my choice of handbag, which was the same pink. So although I think it's somewhere in between the two, I think it's colours that I can immediately see, but it's also um, this desire to try and work with light and tone, which are as important as the colour selection itself. And there's a continued obsession with trying to get two opposing hues that are the same tone. And so they have that vibration when they're next to one another. And it's kind of very hard for the brain to compute which is slightly lighter and which is slightly darker. And so all the colours are laboriously hand mixed in the studio. Um, and I often mix much more than I need because they, you know, they get nudged one way and they need to be nudged back the other way. Um, so it's this kind of ongoing process. Thank you. It's fascinating. Um, Erin, I'm going to come to you now. Um, so again, quoting from Francis Worrell Campbell's um, essay, she describes your photography as um, optical illusion, producing an enigmatic space that shifts between two and three dimensions. The works are created by photographing small still life arrangements of wooden blocks, hand painted by the artist. The depicted spaces are therefore both real and not, an image of a real space in a moment of time that flaunts the tactility of objects while also setting them behind the curious optical flatness of a photograph. So given that you're, you're working in photography, but you're hand painting your models, um, your, your models as in the objects, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're obviously having to think about how your colors translate through, through different mediums. First of all, through, through the paint, and then through the photography of the paint. And I, I thought it'd be interesting to hear how you approach that challenge, but it's not quite the same as just, obviously it's not at all the same as just painting. Yeah. Um... I don't know, it's something, the thing that is strange about it, I guess, is that it's it's always mutable, right? So I can't say that I'm choosing a blue and it will be that blue because there's so many layers of translation. And so the first translation has to do with how the object is in light, you know? And so that's something that, I should have control over at this one, but I don't, <laughs> um, you know, and it has to do even with the sort of weather on that day. Right. And so there's that. And then there's the idea that this thing is, is now a digital file. And so how does Photoshop or how does, you know, Epson decide that it's going to replicate that color. And so there's all these layers where, where the thing that I intend 
has to be pretty open because I don't have control over most of those things. Um, the thing that I think is really interesting in terms of thinking about color um, that I'm sort of constantly fascinated by, I mean, not only kind of relative color in an Albersy kind of way and how things, if a background is red, then that green is going to read differently than if the background is yellow or whatever. So there's those kind of conversations. But I think that the thing that's so fascinating to me is that I can have a block that's all painted yellow and I light it from one side and one side of that will be a dark orange and the other will be yellow as a result just of that light. And so I love that it's this thing that has no end, you know, and um, yeah, anyway, so it's, it's thinking about, I guess, the impacts of space on color in a flat image, if that makes, I mean, which is essentially reiterating the essay, but um, yeah. So, and I think it's in terms of like, getting back to what Rose was talking about and like inspiration, I think it's like, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm sure this happens to everybody, but at a certain point I can get like really interested in looking at things that have super subtle color distinctions, art wise and otherwise. And I'll find that coming in. And then other times I'll look at sort of, um, I don't know, you know, you're looking at Carmen Herrera and you're like, boom, you know, I just want those kind of colors. I want things that feel really bold and really clear. And so I think that there's almost this, um, it's almost like flavor or something that sometimes you really want Italian food and other times you really want something that feels clean. And I don't know. So I feel like it's always this thing that's kind of pulsating behind my thinking, if that makes sense, you know, the color stuff. Thank you. Um, and, and now, um, Leah, um, I mean, Francis describes you um, as a quote, a Miami Beach, Ellsworth Kelly, um, creating art deco signage in ice cream shades, which, I mean, I read that on a cold winter night in, in London and I just <laughs> wanted to kind of jump into your paintings. It's so, it's so tempting. Um, but your colours are really particular. You use these very seductive pastels, which are not that, um, I would say, that commonly used in, in fine art painting these days. Mm -hmm. So why have you opted for, for this kind of palette? Yeah, I feel like with colour, it, it, it's like a way of um, seducing someone, you know, um, to get them to come further. So um, for me, um, I love all of those references. Those are all things that I look at and think about. Um, but for me, yeah, it's just about drawing the viewer's attention because when you see my work from a distance, it feels very flat and constructed. You're not really sure what it's made of. Um, but the, you know, I really do feel like color can draw people in in this really wonderful way um, and sort of manipulate them to like look further into the work um, to really like go around the crevices and see how um, there's these subtle shifts that happen with the edges of my work where oftentimes the edges are painted a different color, um, but you can't really tell because it's painted the shadow color, uh, <laughs> you know, so it's like a heightened shadow for example. Um, and I also, and this might just sound cheesy, but given of the state of the world, like I just also want people to feel really happy when they look at my work. Um, and I'm not gonna like deny that. Um, I think that there, um, there's many types of, way of ways of, you know, aesthetics and I'm into aesthetics that put people in a really positive mood, but also like the way I arrange color, I want it to feel, kind of zen-like also so not just like exciting and seductive but also very calming at the same time um and so that's a lot about what i think about in the studio and most recently in a, in the exhibition and we lost oh. yeah you're there okay Am I still there? <laughs> okay mid-sentence i hope we didn't um, um can you hear me now yeah i can hear you perfectly now okay um, that was yeah, I think I think we heard I think we heard we had we had almost all of that. Um, but maybe the last yeah. sentence. Uh, yeah, so I've just been of... working monochromatically lately, um, which I find is like a really exciting. I'm all about limitations with my practice and just you know creating a puzzle that I have to put together. Um, and one of the new rules I've had is just keeping things a little bit more monochromatic. Um, especially when they're in a room together, like each of them sort of acting like a certain punctuation within the space. 
um, yeah. Thank you. Um, as, as you're all, the three of you are talking, I'm hearing, you know, the, not the similarities, but certain kind of um, themes, if you like, or threads that um, I think I might come back to. I'm gonna ask you all a, a sort of individual question first, and then maybe pick up a couple of, of threads and see how you all respond to that. But um, Rose, I, I really wanted to ask you about, about the frame in your work, because I know that the frame is, the concept of the frame is, is crucial for you. Um, and anyone looking at your work would, would know that anyway, because they often your paintings have this sense that they're somehow a, a sort of a, a painting of a, of a frame or yeah, a, fr a frame of a painting of a frame. Um, so maybe specifically, you know, maybe say a little bit about why the frame is so interesting for you and then how you, you think about the idea of the frame in relationship to your ideas about colour. Okay. Um... So I guess the frame became a constant presence during my time at the Slade between 2008 and 2010. Um, after quite a brutal crit in year one, um, where I arrived feeling quite confident about what my practice was and actually I didn't really have any idea what it was about. And I was working from photographs of architecture, which felt quite exterior to the work I was making and people said, well, why don't you just make phot um, photographs of the architecture, why bother painting it? Um, so I then, was, was, I guess the frame came from logic in the sense that I remember sat on a bus outside Euston Station and thinking, well, what's if you're dealing, if you're working on a rectangle, if you're working on a panel, that kind of surface, what's the most kind of straightforward, the most like honest move to make? And it just felt like, you know, mimicking its surface and creating a frame. And, um, and it, it was a very simple step, I guess, in a sense. It's a very simple thing to do, but it felt like a huge leap and it had taken me a long time to gather the confidence to feel that that was enough. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously artists have done, um, you know, Erin mentioned Alba's earlier and also, you know, artists like Bob Law, I remember seeing his work. He's got a huge painting the Tate Britain where it's, um, or like what is it called something like the bravest thing I ever did or something and he's just drawn you know around the outside and um and I also remember having a crit at the Slade with the wonderful Ed Allington and him saying you know you're kind of making work that was made in the 1960s or earlier or but it doesn't matter because you're making it now and you're doing it for different reasons and um, which I completely stand by I think as artists you should never be shaken by someone making similar work to you because you're you in that time and that's what you're doing so that's kind of where the frame began um, and then in terms of its use of color I guess it was you know it's a it's a device that creates space you know it's a magical device because you can have a blank piece of paper or a blank canvas and as soon as you draw something around it that creates a frame you then create a concept where a vessel that can contain anything, you know, an infinite number of ideas and possibilities. Um, and you mentioned my lockdown lectures and I look a lot at um, painting from the past. I go to the National Gallery more than any other place in order to get my inspiration. And I'm fascinated by how artists use the frame and, you know, artists like Van Eyck and how, where they place colour within the frame. Artists like Caravaggio and once you see their kind of their placement of the primaries and their kind of successes. And I really feel that work is there for us to look at because they've nailed colour within the frame much more than the narrative. Thank you. Um Aaron, you 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 said to me actually earlier that um you felt your your work as an architect and your architectural training. Um, were foundational now to your photography, wrote yes, your art practice. Um, so I wondered if maybe you could just say a few words about about the relationship between architecture and photography and and colour, because I think for many of us who are not particularly expert in architecture, when we think about it, we don't necessarily think about colour. Mm -hmm. Tend not to be very colourful unless you're in Miami Beach with you know, with Leah's kind of palette um, and. Uh, and yet your paintings have this wonderfully kind of potent um, 
colour. So, yeah, maybe talk a little bit about, about that. Um, well, in terms of the architecture, um, I mean, the thing that was interesting to me is just that, again, like our perception of space is so mutable, right? And like, that I think that I see this as real and understandable and distances that I can measure. But, you know, if I were a fly or a bird, all of a sudden the dimensions are quite different, right? And so it's all contingent on the way you see something, right? And a lens is seeing something different than your eye. Um, and so I was interested in photography's ability to kind of like reveal that or mess with it a little bit. Um, and then in terms of color related to that, um, when I was a professor of architecture, um, part of the thing I would do with my students is do the Albers color exercises and we would try to do them sometimes as like three-dimensional studies and sort of try to understand like, is that yellow moving forward? Is yellow always moving forward? Does blue always recede? Like try to understand how color operated spatially. And so those were like really small exercises I would do, but I was always like sort of obsessed with them. <laughs> um, and so, and, and disappointed really that there isn't more idea about color in architecture because it is so potent as a spatial thing, right? And so um, anyway, so, then I had got a sabbatical and I started trying to build those Albers color exercises as three-dimensional things, like, and try to understand then how the camera translates that. And so anyway, there was this kind of like almost stepping stones between thinking about how space operated. And even, you know, you think about forced perspective or something like that, right? That space is, I can make your eye do anything, right? Your eye is a completely and utterly manipulatable thing and so but you believe that it's not and painters show you that all the time but photographers I want to be like okay I'm I'm trying to do that too um but anyway so I think about I guess both color and space is kind of moving targets and and super related because they have such incredible spatial consequence and so trying to make images that sort of I don't know find that in some way or identify it you know anyway I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> it does. I mean, it's almost as if the absence of colour in, in a lot of architecture was what kind of caused you to focus perhaps more on. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, I mean, there's a weird phobia about colour in a certain way, right? And that colour becomes something that interior designers care about and that's somehow like irrelevant or something. And I felt like, I don't know, it's really powerful. And not only in terms of like, mood and your tactile kind of awareness of things like there's a whole lot of stuff there and so anyway I guess leaving academia was a way that I could sort of think about those things maybe a little bit more <laughs> anyway I think that's a really good um way of, of moving into your work Leah actually in terms of, of sort of tactility and um and also kind of sensuality because it's impossible not to feel a kind of sensual charge from your from your works um, and you're working with materials like I was fascinated by the fact that you're using pumice stone um, and your work has this, um, this, this, sort of, this sort of flirtation between flatness and relief and the way the mm -hmm. material and the colour works. So that even so if you've got, you know, one material painted in one colour next to another material painted ostensibly in the same colour, but then they, they become different and they, and they mm -hmm. talk to each other. Um, and I... I mean, it would be easy to consider your works or to be almost sculptural, be hanging sculptures. Um, and I wondered if that was something that, that, that resonated with you, that the idea that they were crossing that line over with sculpture and sort of using colour and material and that, that tension between them to do it. Yeah, you know, that's a really great question. Um, I grew up a painter. I've always been a painter. Um, and the, what, the reason why I came into this way of working is that I really enjoyed working um, abstractly, especially in grad school. I started making these like geometric abstractions um, at Rutgers. So, you know, studying with people like Stephen Westfall. So obviously wanted to be, you know, commendable with my cohort. <laughs> um, and in any event, I, um, I kind of hated painting for that. Like I started hating it. I hated the way that shapes like met I just had so much anxiety about like 
the, like, you know, I, I've always liked these sort of compartmentalized compositions. But when the shapes would like meet up, I'd just be like, do I blend it? Do I make it flat? Like, and it was just the stupid thing. I don't know. And I um, so I started working with fabric exclusively and like draping fabric over canvas and like was like, oh, cool. Fabric is paint. This is really fun. And then I started wrapping sections of paintings. And then I started cutting up foam and like creating these, what are sort of became organically the type the mode of working that I work with to this day um and so it is interesting because I um you know I'm I'm not a sculptor but I guess I'm knowing I'm not a painter you know I'm just an artist now you know um <laughs> and um the, I like the, that the lines are really blurred within the the forms um I think you know just like everyone's work in the show it's like we're all sort of crossing different boundaries um I just think it's more interesting um, to me, like, I feel like when you look at a rectangular painting on a wall, it, you know, it evokes a certain conversation and a certain history. And I think that like breaking the frame um, and, re, you know, each section of my work is basically a mini painting. It's all stretched canvas in those little shapes and then put together. Um, but so it sort of like feels like a wonderful relief to be like distance from that history a little bit um and then sort of create a different path um you know you can never avoid the history of painting um and I'm not trying to disregard it at all but it's I think it's fun that I find really interesting yeah it's it's really interesting that um, the the practice you have now the mature practice seems to have come out of quite a strong sense of conflict of looking at those um those two shades next to each other or several shades next to each other and thinking, I don't know what to do. And somehow out of that difficulty came, came something much more productive. Yeah, and it's funny because it's not any easier to build shapes that are like this shape and then stretch canvas over them. I mean, it's actually a lot harder <laughs> physically, but I feel like I have more of a sense of control um, within the framework. Um, and that because of that control, I can sort of question and, uh, you, you've dropped out briefly. So I've just gone, okay. to else. <laughs> but we'll bring you back in again. <laughs> um, but, um, but, um, Rose, yes. Um, I mean, your, your works are, I was fascinated by, you have three panels standing next to each other very carefully, which are one work, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Work. So, I mean, is it a painting? Is it a sculpture? Um, do you, how do you, do you, have, do you have strong feelings? I mean, you must have strong feelings about that. Artists always have strong feelings about, about their work. I do have strong feelings about yeah. that. Tell me, tell us. It's a painting. <laughs> painting. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, so, before you, so, so, okay, so if it's a painting, why, why like that? Why so? So complicated for um, your painting. So I'm wondering whether to give the more personal side or the like straightforward side. Um, I guess they kind of, uh, so last like uh, 2019, I think I was in a bit of a rut for various reasons. Um, and uh, often the case, my mother helped me out of it um, by, uh, suggesting that I um, applied to the RWA Sculpture Open, which is the Royal West Academy, it's in Bristol, so the gallery. And, um, and I kind of said, well, I don't really make sculpture, <laughs> but I had these panels, um, wooden panels in my studio that were kind of like this big, that were double-sided. They'd been knocking around for about three years. And so I thought, um, okay, well, maybe I'll give it a go. Because um, I just I, I'd really like them as objects, but I didn't know what to do with them. Um, so I made those, um, and was very pleased when they they got into the show and they were displayed um, um, on a plinth. I think I never actually got to see it, but um, and so when that happened, I thought, well, maybe you know it'd be nice to scale it up. But I th always thought of those. I thought of those as paintings, and then when I was making. The work for this show I wanted to make it clearer that they were paintings because the previous smaller ones I'd made were a bit chunkier and so for the ones um, 
in the show with Cook Latham, I spent a long time figuring out the dimensions in terms of, so the, the height of them are my eye line. Um, and that, that length is then um, divided by 1.5 to get the, the width. And then the depth of them, um, I spent a long time trying to figure out because they needed to be deep enough to feel solid on the floor that they could stand, but thin enough to read as paintings because I really wanted them to feel um, stacked. And I thought it was really interesting what um, Leah was just saying about, you know, she said she's not sure if she's a painter, a sculptor, she's an artist. And I think I, I really, I love that. And because I think so often art is quickly put into categories. Um, and with like Erin's work as well, because of she she is making photographs, but so often, and I've had the pleasure to be in the gallery and see people approach her pieces and be like, what, what are they? And, you know, have that kind of um, confusion in terms of medium. So I really, I really wanted the large works to read as a stack of paintings. And often I feel it is this kind of intention. I may, when I was making them, I felt I was making paintings. And I don't know, a sculptor feels they're making sculptures. I guess there's always that classic thing as sculptures, what you trip over when you stand back from a painting. But you know, it's um, so I hope that the, I hope it's the scale of them, the width that indicates that they're painting to the viewer, but to me, they're very much made as paintings. Well, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm, it's lovely when someone's so clear about it as well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> very reassuring. I, uh, I will say, I if I can chime in, that yeah. I totally understand where you're coming from because I have a rule as well where like the work cannot be more than two inches wide. <laughs> Maybe two and a half. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's way bigger. It might be really a sculpture. I like this in between space. And anyway, just to say, I am, that makes total sense to me. <laughs> I mean, I was going to ask all of you because it was listening to all of you talk. What was what's really clear, but you can also tell from the work because it is so it's such sensitive kind of considered work. The what whatever choices you're making about about color and and the other elements of your work, they are really really considered choices, and you are controlling you know as as much as you can control. And I think you've almost all used the word control. Um, and I was so Erin, you know, because you haven't we haven't really asked you about about this. I mean, do you, how do you how do you find that balance between between kind of keeping control so that the work is successful, but at the same time, you know, allowing kind of the imagination, the, the artistic impulse to. Um, I, I mean, I never, I never have a plan to do stuff. I mean. So I just sort of make those objects and then I kind of see what happens. And I think for me, there's a, just a moment, I guess what I'm always looking for is that there's something that happens where the things, where whatever is going on in the image starts being more than the things, like another thing starts happening that's almost parallel to the fact of this arrangement of, the, of objects. And, I never know how or when that's going to happen. And so in terms of my studio practice, it's really like I'm playing the whole time and I'm just, and you know, I can discover stuff like recently just discovering, I mean, this sounds idiotic, but like, Oh, uh, an ellipse foreshortens into a circle and that's really cool. <laughs> and like, <laughs> but it's only just through kind of like fooling around with stuff that I start seeing that and seeing, Oh, there's some possibilities there. How can that, how does that read when it's flattened? Because if you looked at it in real space, it looks like nothing, nothing. You never understand that foreshortening. It's only through an image that you understand it, right? And so, I don't know. So it's, there's never a plan if that's, I don't know. And so it's always just about setting up opportunities to discover some moment of, I don't know. I don't know what the right word is, but something happens that feels, interesting and so that's what I'm always looking for and days and days can go by and nothing interesting happens and all of a sudden <laughs> I, I also um read Erin actually it seems to be almost um and it's counterintuitive to what you've just said but I was fascinated you said you were um 
you like photography, you're drawn to photography because unlike sculpture, it, it never resolves itself into a thing. Yeah. And I love that idea of a kind of non-thing that you were sort of, you were actually aiming for a kind of... Something. Oh, yeah, because the thing is that, you know, any, any photograph, you never really know. Like, a painting you know. I'm in the same space as the painter was in when they made it. And so we have a kind of, like, agreement about what that image is. But in a, in a photograph, like, I'm making it and I know exactly what's going on. You will never know as a viewer. You have no idea. And so that uncertainty, I think, is so interesting to me because there's there's always that last kind of veil that you can never, ever get past. Um, yeah, and, you know, I guess that's, that is something that keeps it kind of endlessly fascinating for me, you know. Well, I think one of the things that's, for me, been really fascinating engaging with all your practices is that you're all artists where there are quite clearly a lot of layers. And what you see is 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 fabulous, but it's also really not not what you get. I mean, you know, with all three of you, I can, there was a point when I was preparing this, when I almost wished I could talk to all of that I could just do three different talks like, for an hour, because I felt that there was so, there was so much happening in each of your practices. And yet, what's interesting is that formally, you do have very you know, tight, I would say, tight controlled practices. Um, and I was really taken, Rose, when you were, um, I think, in, in the lecture about your own work, when you said at a certain point you were, you showed, you showed works that were mistakes, where you were kind of um, trying to be, I think, abstract expressionist, and it just wasn't really working <laughs> for you at all. <laughs> and I thought it was great. It was so honest. And it was really, um, it was really illuminating as well for someone who was interested in your practice to see that you did have, you know, you did have a moment where you, where you went off and experimented with being maybe a bit more kind of expressionist and loose, and, and then you were like, no, <laughs> this is not. <laughs> so all of you have this kind of, um, yeah, this very subtle, I would say, um, kind of form of, of expression. I'm using the word expression kind of in, in quotes, I guess. But Le Leah, I wanted to just um, come to you quite specifically about one thing, because I felt of, of all three of you, the artist who maybe um, was crossing over into a, at least a more like like I could I could pick it up political space in some way was perhaps you. And that's and I, I think you've you said that you feel that your work refers to communal space. Mm -hmm. That was really interesting. I just wondered if you could just tell us a bit about what you mean by that. Yeah, I feel you know they evoke certain things like you might think of a diner you know where you feel to actually smoke at a diner and hang out with friends and talk and like um you know sort of that they're the, this inviting environment where you said before too which I thought was really important that the um these colors aren't typically used in like fine art settings right and I really like pushing that um that parameter um that everyone's sort of welcome here. You know, you can all come to this work and get something from it. Um, that it's like, it can be extremely complex or it can be simple. Um, and that, um, yeah, that's really important to me in the work. Um, you know, also a friend once told me that she feels like my work is like a protective shield. Like she feels like she could just lift them off the wall and put them in front of her and that they would protect her from all like sexism, racism, all these. And I'm like, yes, yes, that's brilliant. Anyway, so I really love that. And um, so that just, you know, also has to do with the sort of communal environment that um, it's not exclusive, it's inclusive. It's not uh, mean, it's nice, It's but it's also uh, not dumb, it's challenging. You know, there's many layers. I mean, I think probably I use the words, um, I use the word, the word political might not be quite right. I guess social might be a better, that your work operates in a social space. And, and on that sort of note, I mean, Rose, yeah, I mean, do you feel, how do you feel your work operates in relation to the social space? And if it doesn't, that's completely fine. Um, um, I think that's what... <laughs> It's been nice having um, the pieces on the floor. Um, uh, I had a friend come to see the show 
um, last week who was running around and around the work going, it needs activating, it needs activating, it needs activating, which I thought was um, pretty hysterical. Um, and that was, so that was like unusual because kind of, I can't remember if it was Erin or Leah said earlier about, you know, when you have a painting on the wall, you know, there isn't as, it's a kind of not so much as a dynamic relationship. Um, and um, I, I, I think work should be um, interacted with, you know, and, and my pieces are often sometimes, I guess, can appear a bit austere and a little bit cold. Um, so I really relish um, the opportunity to do something different with them. And I actually, my collaborator, Sarah Kate Wilson, who we, I curate alongside our project show off was an opportunity to do that well, where works are actually moved and brought on stage in front of a seated audience. And um, Cook Latham very generously hosted that project um, in March. And so it was really fun to see my works be held and moved because you get a completely different sense. You know, it's the relationship of work to body, it's weight, it's, it's just so much more interesting. So I would like to think perhaps in the future it would be an opportunity to create some kind of piece that would have um, more possibilities in terms of creating a space outside of itself. Yeah, that, no, that's that that makes perfect. And also, to be fair, I'm just gonna. I've just had a, seen a question from the audience. Um, I think Jeremy's asked if there's any chance of seeing your work. And I think the, the most straightforward answer is to say if you go onto the website of of Cook Latham. You, you, I'm sure you can do at the same time as being on Zoom. Um, the, the exhibition is is absolutely there, so you can just click through it. Um, I hope I hope that makes sense. Um, uh, um, yeah. Um, no, just to come, come back to you for a moment, Rose. Um, also, in your in your lecture, you you talk about the different collaborations that you've done, and you've also been curating shows, haven't you? With um, with your fellow artists and, and I think people that you were that you were studying with as well. So in, and, and they were clearly very social occasions, not in terms, I mean, like a party, yes, but also just in terms of the way you were thinking about space and how people were interacting with the work. I mean, it's yeah. very, in that sense, it's, it's, it's very kind of social work. Totally, and I think um, I've had the great pleasure to have um, kept very close contact with the people that I studied with at the Slade. And um, and actually, um, this uh, last month, Ambit magazine um, was co-edited by myself and Sarah. And one of the articles that we um, that we presented in the magazine was a selection of images from a WhatsApp group made up of artists from the Slade. Um, and it was just a it, it just images, and it's just stuff that was being shared. Mm -hmm. So like artworks, political stuff, jokes, like random mm -hmm. random stuff. But I think other artists, they like these spaces just to put stuff out there and bounce things around. And so it was really nice to be actually be able to capture this social space for you know a group of artists, um, just trying to kind of figure stuff out really, because I think being an artist is often very lonely and can sometimes feel, um, you can feel like it's a little bit impossible, but as soon as you start speaking to other people who are doing a similar thing, it then doesn't feel such a strange kind of enterprise. And I think you're, you know, and everyone has ups and downs. My studio's, oh, I don't know. My studio's full of failures, but that's okay. <laughs> um, we've, we've got, um, thank you, no, that's, um, that's wonderful. Um, we've had a, another question. We've only got about 10 minutes left. So um, I think we might, it's, it's a lovely question actually. I don't know who it's from. But um, I'll come to you, Erin, with this one. But um, the uh, and then and then to, to the to the other two. Um, so, um, are there any texts in literature or theory that have informed the way that you think about colour? Hmm. I mean, I'm going to refer to it again, but the Alvar stuff, just because I taught it for so all those years. Um, yeah, say a bit about Albert because he's such a fundamental artist for, for colour in the 20th century. Yeah, um, I don't, I mean, you know, it was just for me, I mean, it's going to be kind of obvious, but just teaching that stuff and seeing 
when you put, you know, whatever, the same green on the red and the brown or whatever, and how much it shifts. And just sort of as teaching people and having them do that. And each time they would be like, whoa, like this is unbelievable that this is a shift. And sort of, I don't know, it's like it opens up something in your brain that like, oh, all this stuff, I've been seeing it kind of differently than it actually is. Um, so I think that that, to a certain extent, is present. Um, yeah, but in terms of texts and stuff, I don't know beyond that. I mean, well, might be, might be yeah, nothing be. about color specifically. But uh, Leah, yeah. what about you? Any particular books, texts, theorists? I mean, Albers, of course, but I really like this um, encyclopedia called Google. <laughs> 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 but I'm serious. I think like being an artist right now is uh, so awesome because. Um, I mean, that this might not be the right answer to the question, but it's a sincere one for me. Um, I love looking at images and seeing colors together already, like on a screen. Um, I think that's so helpful. Like if I can choose, you know, I spent a lot of time in Kenya and so I really love Swahili architecture. Um, so sometimes I just like go on Pinterest and just scroll and scroll and scroll and look at all of the architecture. And then I'll come across like a room that like feels really familiar from like where I was and say, I love that palette. I'm going to just save that. And, you know, I, I think sometimes I feel like I'm think like a interior designer with like a storyboard. I'm like really embarrassed to say that, but I feel it, you know, I love seeing the colors together already and then having something to um, jump from to like move from. Cause it's like, if you're just making it up, then you only get so far. But if you start with an image, and then you can work even farther from that image. I don't know. So I really like just the, you know, nonstop uh, filtration of images that feels really important to me as like a visual. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's, that's wonderful. I think it's really interesting. And I'm sure you're not at all alone. Um, Cause I noticed this as a writer too, that you say you feel kind of, you know, embarrassed about, you know, feeling like you may be, kind of straying into interior design and there's that whole um sort of I think very false dichotomy between decorative and you know high mm -hmm. art which you know um you're crossing over um to an extent um and it's you know I think you also talked about aesthetics which, and those are you know even saying aesthetics these days sometimes you feel that someone's going to come say, yeah oh, I have to say that I'm not allowed to say you like it I um, and I find that it's, I think it's, it's, it's wonderful because your work is, is very powerful on, on many levels, but there's no reason why it can't be, you know, also powerful on an aesthetic level. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's again, it's about like, the, or if it feels like a living room, that's great because I really, you know, want it to feel like a communal space that bring, you know, so I had a studio visit with Peter Sheldahl in graduate school. And he was just like, your work is so decorative with a capital B and I fucking love it. And I'm like, oh, cool. All right. So maybe decorative is not a bad thing. Um, all right. Let's go for it. Great. Um, Rose, what about you? Texts that have influenced you? Um, I don't know. I mean, I love what Suzanne has to say about colour. Um, but I think maybe a little bit like Leah, like, for me, it's it's a visual thing. Like, I, yeah, I go to the National Gallery, like I mentioned earlier, and I'll look at like Battle of San Romano by Uccello, and there's the white horse on the the far right. And if you just look at the stirrup strap and like the armor and the color of the saddle, the horse, you've got like this mint green, this pink, this blue, this gold. And for me, it's colors a visual thing that you can draw knowledge from by looking and mm. likewise be talking about like the Arnold Finney portrait, the oranges, the blue sleeve, the green the dress, the red bed, the purple robe, the you know, the brass golden chandelier. That's where I get my colour theory from, from images, not from text. Mm. I mean it's fascinating because you're you know you're all absolutely contemporary artists. Um and and yeah, obviously, uh, but colour is universal and, you know, timeless, really. We've all, all had colour in our, you know, throughout throughout history. I wondered if, and this is to any of you, 
you know, whether any of you felt you wanted to say anything about colour colour now in, in 2020, um, either as opposed to colour in the 16th century or, or just now, because it's quite interesting, because colour changes, I think, the way we... Yeah, yeah. I think it's also just interesting that, I mean, I can, like, reference colour in these photographs, but ultimately, like, the ultramarine blue is now something totally other that a company makes at a headquarters, probably in Switzerland somewhere, like, so that there's a distance. And so, but it still refers back, I think, to this idea of blue or green or yellow that is implanted in painting where there was a kind of genuine relationship between the pigment and the thing that the pigment was derived from, right? And so I think color, I don't know, it's it's a weird thing now. It's a little bit more, um, I don't know, trancing or something. It doesn't feel quite as anchored, you know? That would turn um, your practice, Leah, wouldn't it, in a way, the way you feel, you obviously, you're, you might feel you're taking a risk. You're quite brave about the way you say, yes, I can take from all these very contemporary kind of chromatic influences without needing to be kind of too haunted by. Yeah, I mean, also, I think we all could agree maybe that we like synthetic colors. You know, like we're not pulling colors from the natural world. Um, and I think like I think that's also really um, a rich place to pull color from is that it doesn't it feels like an other thing in the room that there's a separation between this object, this painting, this photograph um, from us. And I think that distinction is really important to me, at least. Yeah, no, that's 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 really interesting. I mean, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I think we've we've come to the end of our um of our allotted time, but um I I hope um I hope you've all enjoyed it. I've absolutely loved it. I feel I could stay here and chat with you all night. I kind of say like, can we all meet up again? Do this some more. Um, it's you're you're a wonderful um sort of combination because you you're you're all so different you have this one thread which is what makes it I have to say you know a, a great show um but yeah thank you so much I'm I'm really grateful to have had the chance to to chat with you actually thank you um Clemency and Charlotte I don't know if one of you want to come in now and, and do the final goodbyes you hear me I'm having I can't yeah. actually we can hear you. Yes. Oh, hello. <laughs> Everyone, thank you so much. That was so honest and um, and enlightening. That was really great. I could have gone on for ages. I could have missed supper for more. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much. Um, we're so proud of the show, and I'm only sorry you're not with us in person. Wow. Wishing you all the best. And Rachel, thank you so much. That was incredibly... Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. As well. Thank you, thank you. Really beautifully that. done. It's a real skill. <laughs> I, I loved every minute of that. I'm so thrilled to have kind of, you know, had this time to, to look at all your work. And I hope to get a chance to actually write about it. I did get that feeling, which is always a really good sign of thinking, I just write about this. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> Exciting show. Well, thank you all so much. Take care and thank, thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so everyone you. for coming. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.